And now, chapter 25 of The Last Boy on Earth, The Battle of the Stone Tower. They came from all over the city, these strange implacable forms thundering over the ground like titans or frost giants of old. They emerged from the thick darkness with weapons brandished, alive and mobile for the first time since they were molded in the furnace, some at least a century old. Who were these warriors coming to the aid of Brady Smith, still helplessly chained to the stone tower in the graveyard? Leading the charge with his saber brandished high in front of him, a look of grim determination on his face, Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain of the 20th Maine entered the fray. Behind him followed the ranks of statues from the parks and monuments of the two cities, the three loggers from the Pierce Memorial next to the Bangor Public Library, each one of them nine feet tall, carrying axe and peavy. Following close behind was Hannibal Hamlin, first vice president under Abraham Lincoln. His long bronze cape flowing in the wind, his walking cane brandished like a cudgel. Then there was the winged statue of Victory, her flame a bright torch whose fire lit the night. There were others as well, most of which were known to Brady, including the fiberglass astronaut from the military supply store. These sculptures stood like timeless sentinels for years against the onslaught of frost, snow, hurricane, and worst of all, time. But here they were, alive and mobile, detached from their bases, walking and running into the open area in front of the stone tower to come between Brady and the monster known as Grendel. The earth shook with their advance. General Joshua Chamberlain stood between the monster and the boy, firm as a boulder against Grendel's approach. It was clear that the monster was confused, caught off his guard. The personification of Brady's concept of evil was facing a personified person. How singularly strange the comparison, thought the general, as he said, Stay back! Keep your distance! You'll harm this boy no more! The monster drew in a breath and seemed to grow in size as he took a step forward toward the talking statue. This was not flesh and bone. This was not anything but metal, even down to the lowest molecular level. For Grendel, there was no way in, no doorway for intimidation, because he was anathema to life, and these statues were something other than alive. He was not their polar opposite. All he had against a walking metal man was sheer brute strength. His massive hammer hand reached forward to clutch the warrior's arm in hopes of ripping and snapping it from the brittle bronze that formed him. However, he found that the stiff metal, like flesh, did not snap but bent and then reformed. The general wasted no time in hacking at Grendel with the dull bronze sword, that for all of its poor quality as a blade still caused the monster to reel backwards in pain, howling out to the skies. Grendel stepped back a few paces, and the general used that moment to turn and cut the chains that bound Brady to the stone tower. There you go, Prometheus, he said calmly, turning back to face the monster, like he had already read Brady's mind. And Brady was reborn. All the self-pity and loathing that he had felt inside was, for him, the true abandonment. It was gone. Because someone moved heaven and earth to come to his aid, he was renewed. Thanks, Hercules, he replied. At this point, if anyone could have seen, they would have noticed a wry smile forming on the face of the general underneath that massive Civil War era mustache. Rout him out, boys! Attack! Attack! called the general. The army of bronze moved forward with all the lithe grace of seasoned warriors toward the darkness and the were-dogs. What ensued, if anyone could have filmed it, could best be described as flashes of light and color, sounds of wounding, a vignette of a lumberjack against the walking angry Fenris, as axes fell and metal arms met with all too weak flesh. The battle of the stone tower had begun. 
In strobe light staccato they grappled, the personas of men and the myths of their imagination, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Brady found himself looking for a weapon, but still couldn't bring himself to pick up the rifle at his feet. He stood behind the general and waited for... what? Time here was frozen in the moment as he discerned the various statues fighting the were-dogs. Time in a battle is not like time in any other situation known to humans. It's a long and winding thing, a tenacious insect that claws its way forward toward its end. Time in a battlefield does not flow like normal time. It climbs, backtracks, and stands still as one opponent meets the other in combat. So it was here, the only light visible coming from the torches of the statue Brady referred to as victory, both her torches worked as flamethrowers in the darkness, burning away the dark and the were-dogs in their path. With blast after blast, the fire spewed from her torch and cut at the edges of the were-dog pack and at Grendel himself. Grendel understood what was happening. If this new world had such beings from within, he would meet them from within. Deep down inside the prison that held them like Cronus held his own swallowed children, the monster opened his throat and vomited out the nightmares and fears of old that he had absorbed many nights ago. They came out of him in ectoplasmic sheets and ribbons, white and ethereal, flowing like icy water into the darkness and the night sky. Brady watched behind the form of the general as the sound filled the sky and the battle effectively stopped. Everyone waited to see how this would affect the outcome of their fray. The whirling tornado of forms turned in the air about them for a moment and a hundred or a thousand, perhaps a million voices could be heard shouting and swearing, screaming and crying. These were the enemies of humanity. The Keres that Joe had referred to, all personified diseases and ailments, dreads, horrors, terrors, hatreds, loathings, and fears. They had agreed to the joining with Grendel for their very survival, and now they had been released to fight for him. Useless in this form, and only powerful when inflicting the bodies of humans, they were cancer and AIDS, anthrax, typhoid and cholera, and a hundred other ailments that had claimed victims, millions of them, over the centuries. They flew from form to form, seemingly sniffing at the air, tasting the statues and finding nothing there to fight. They were useless against them as mere diseases, no, they needed hosts. They needed humans to worry and bother, taunt and infect. But all they had was Brady, and he seemed impervious to their onslaught. They arose again into the blackness, each one of them a ribbon of nearly transparent white, and then they flew upward into the dark night sky and out of sight. Everyone on the battlefield looked up, wondering where they had gone as the form of Grendel, now smaller and more like the original monster Brady had first encountered in the hospital while rescuing Kaylee, stood weakened. From above them they heard a screaming in the sky as the white-ribboned worms of disease sought new living tissue. They entered the bodies of the were-dogs violently, knocking the creatures down to the ground and pushing the air out of their lungs. It became clear to Brady why Grendel had purged himself of his assimilated strength as the affected were-dogs began to shiver and quake on the ground. Their whole bodies took on the semblance of Grendel's ever-morphing face as though the bones beneath their skin were being rearranged in some evil and malevolent way to create new forms. Their flesh quavered as though dancing to some discordant music and they grew taller and more muscular. Nip, obvious purpose. As the transformations continued, Brady realized that Grendel had unleashed his army of titans, had opened his Pandora's box. Around him began to form an opponent for every statue that had come to his aid under General Chamberlain's command. Brady had to stop himself from vomiting as he viewed them. One had flesh that appeared to melt off in sheets. One had growths of reddish black all over its form, and they appeared to writhe and twist of their own accord. Still another had yellow weeping pores from which issued foul-smelling and acidic pus. For each of the new monsters being created, Brady felt the pit of his stomach fall more deeply. 
Now, instead of one monster in the form of Grendel, there were seven new ones, each one formidable. The statues under the command of General Chamberlain awaited their orders. Each of them stood resolute, unafraid, and this brightened Brady's wavering hopes. He wondered if they felt fear. He wondered how their life was different from his own. He could die, but could they? He imagined that they could be destroyed, torn apart, or melted down. Looks like the battle just got more interesting, said the general to Brady, shielding him. How did you know I was here? shouted Brady. Your amazing raven and Dr. Franklin informed me this morning, he answered calmly, in the quiet before the next round of fighting. Of course, Brady exclaimed. Yes, Benjamin Franklin can be very persuasive when he wants to be, answered the general. He talked my feet right off that pedestal. And then we went from park to park, statue to statue, awakening them together. Seems these good fellows, he said, indicating the statues waiting for the next wave of fighting to commence, had been watching and were wondering too. When I explained your predicament, they all agreed to come to your aid, each and every one of them. The statue of Hannibal Hamlin strode up to Brady and said, We've met before, son, in the library. A pleasure to meet you in the... Uh, well, I was going to say the flesh, but that isn't right, is it? Anyway, I am pleased to meet you here like this. Me too, Mr. Vice President, responded Brady. Where are Hugin and Ben? Well, they've gone to find Cayley and your wizard. We'll need all the help we can get, answered Hamlin. They're going to bring them here, asked Brady, obviously concerned. They, sh they shouldn't do that. They need to survive. Survive? Are you worried you're going to die, Brady? asked Chamberlain. Well, yeah, replied the boy. Looking at Hamlin, they both shook their heads and smiled. You have to survive, Brady. You're essential. You're frightened, and you'd be foolish not to be. But see this through. Stand with us. Fight with us. Together with you leading us, nothing can stop us, so long as we stand together. Brady weighed the general statement in his mind and heart. Anyway, standing and fighting seemed better to him than hiding behind the general like a child. I need a weapon, he said simply. Here, said Hamlin, take this one. It's a cane as a club. It does wonderfully. I can use my own bare hands against these fellows, he said with resolve. Brady hefted Hamlin's cane and found it to be heavy and therefore deadly. He tested it against the air and smiled. Thank you, sir. Brady, my boy, I'm proud to stand with you against the powers of darkness. Our union must stand. And from the darkness, the unaffected were-dogs were growing restless. Grendel was with the six monstrous forms that had mutated from were-dog to mythic beast. There was the Lernaean Hydra, the Eurymanthian Boar. There was Cerberus and the Balrog, the Rancor from Star Wars, and the Jabberwock from Wonderland. They huddled together and gathered their strength as Grendel communicated with them in a wordless cellular way, sending chemical messages to them through physical contact, communicating on a primitive level. A simple command was issued. They burst forth together, but each took a different direction as they sought the statue they had been created to battle. One chose victory, while another chose the logger with the peavy, as one by one each of these forces collided in the cemetery. Brady watched as the other two loggers were each engaged in battle by Cerberus. Ancient foes grappled on the ground in close and deadly combat. The monsters were stronger than they appeared. Brady was trying to help, but it was clear that Grendel would be his opponent. Into the fray the monsters swarmed, their own various appendages flailing at the moving sculptures like sledgehammers, pounding down a rain of destruction. Each statue fought valiantly. The general in particular found himself hacking and slashing at the beast he knew to be the Hydra. For most of his adult life, the real Chamberlain had lived with a wound that most surgeons would have judged mortal. At the siege of Petersburg in 1864, a mini-ball pierced his right hip and groin. Chamberlain fought on during that battle, even though he lost a copious amount of blood. They pronounced him dead. The newspapers even reported his death. 
But he survived, received Lee's sword at Appomattox, became the governor of Maine and the president of Bowdoin College. Not even the hydra of legend could stop such a man. I didn't have six horses shut out from under me and survived six wounds, one of them mortal, just to allow you to even so much as lay a finger on me, you minion of Hades. His foe slashed at him with heads full of hundreds of large, spiny teeth, jabbing at the general over and over again. In his turn, the general simply used his sword to slice them off, falling like icicles from a spring roof line. They regrew the needles, and he kept cutting, mowing them like so much hay. At the last moment, victory arrived, and began cauterizing the wounds as Chamberlain decapitated each repulsive head. The others were fighting with all of their might. Vice President Hannibal Hamlin was engaged in battle with a small corpulent creature, red-faced and foul breath. His weapons were long snake-like tendrils that emerged from his sides like Shiva. They wove their way around the vice president's ponderous trunk, trying to squeeze him around the neck, his arms, and his legs. Brady watched as, in the blink of an eye, the muscular form of Hamlin fought back, ripping tendrils from the creature's side. Too late, Brady realized the vice president was caught off his balance and he tumbled to the ground, his head snapping off and rolling away like a pumpkin thrown by a teenager on Halloween. He watched the head, and he could have sworn that he heard the decapitated head of Hannibal Hamlin shout, It's only a flesh wound, you baby. Come back here and I'll bite your legs off. Victory's flamethrowers were growing weaker as she spent what she had left on the balrog. Never once did she fail to move forward toward it, advancing ever to make the creature stagger backward. Its unnatural abomination of weaponry consisted mostly of its own fire and internal flame, ever seeping and weeping onto the statue, eating away at the bronze, like strong sulfuric acid. Victory grappled with the thing, and it nearly covered her in its ooze, a blob of foul excrement draped over the symbol of achievement. Victory's left arm was eaten away by the dribbling mass that was the Balrog's weapon, until finally the statue's left arm cracked and then fell too to the ground with a resounding thud. Everywhere he looked, the statues fought bravely but seemingly in vain. Advancing toward him was the form of the beast, Grendel. He was no longer as tall or muscular as he had once been, since shedding himself of the caras that now tore the shreds of peace and laid waste to his only allies. Brady thought as hard as he could, Please, Kaylee, stay away, stay away, don't come for me, run, hoping that she might hear or see or know. Brady didn't immediately grapple with the beast. He had no weapons except for his fists and his brain, and he certainly didn't have a plan. Grendel could crush him with one fist, with one simple fluid movement, so the only thing he could think of to do was run. He'd been chained all day to a rock, and he had been wounded, but when he looked down to see his broken arm, he discovered that he was healed. No, he thought, no, that can't be. Last time this happened, it was because Kaylee had been near me, kind to me, caring. Oh, that means she's near. No, he screamed in his mind as he turned his back on the advancing giant and sprinted away into the darkness of the ever-deepening night. Jumping over gravestones like they were hurdles, he made much faster progress than Grendel, who simply found himself knocking them down and often falling, an arrogant, lumbering creature at best. The dead were helping him as they appeared throughout the cemetery, pointing with faintly glowing hands which direction Brady should run, leading him, showing him by seeing through his own eyes the path which he should take. Brady remembered their faces looking at him, heard the orphan boy say, You are not alone, and took courage from the memory. All of the dead wanted him to live, and though they couldn't directly interact with the world, they could influence Brady, a boy who walked between the worlds. Down a steep incline, Brady bounded, while behind him the monster shouted epithets and curses. Although he was unsure of his final destination, what mattered most to Brady was movement. The beast was now so far behind him that he was a dot in the moonlit distance, fumbling towards him awkwardly. 
Brady ran past the orphans' graves and the graves of the elder lady's home until he saw it. There, near the entrance to the cemetery, was the form of an angel, made of metal, holding the body of a fallen soldier from the Great War. It was a loving, protective thing, a beauty to behold even in the grim shadows of this night. Brady had seen it before and never given it a second thought, but now he felt as though he was in the presence of something divine, something elegant and perfect, love for a fallen soldier, pathos for humankind in the form of a divine being. I have seen them all fall, whispered the angel in bells and chimes. I'm ready to die, Brady managed to say from his heaving chest. You are not meant to die, not this night, whispered the angel. Then please tell me what I have to do, pleaded Brady, looking over his shoulder at the advancing form of Grendel, whose obvious anger was mounting. He would be sure to visit every ounce of anger upon the weaponless boy when he finally caught up with him. The angel looked skyward, holding the dead soldier even more closely, tenderly, like a child. And even though Brady had just witnessed the most macabre and frightening scene of his entire life, and even though he had faced near certain death from the hammer hands of Grendel, he found himself suddenly visited by peace. The angel raised its loose arm and pointed to the great river less than 500 yards away. Sometimes the best thing you can do is nothing at all. Sometimes the best thing you can say is nothing. And then the angel looked back at the heavens and settled into its quiet, solid, metallic repose. The Penobscot River. Brady didn't stop to think or wonder. Instead, he bolted out the front gate of the cemetery across U.S. Route 2 and down the hill to the railroad tracks. Behind him, thrusting himself forward, now unhindered by tombstones, rumbled Grendel. But where Brady was lithe and fleet of foot, the monster was ever ponderous and clumsy. Brady was past the railroad tracks and then down to the riverside. He didn't know how deep the water was. He hadn't set foot in it, not even once since the abandonment had settled down upon the world. Now, without reason or cause, he flung himself into the water. It was deep, for he felt no ground beneath his feet. Brady was a tremendous swimmer and moved easily, swimming to a few feet of the shore, and then quietly he floated, trying to move as little as possible. Grendel made it to the edge of the water and stopped. He searched the riverbank with his eyes, turned around and looked behind him up the hill, and Brady could tell that the monster could not see him in the water. Ah, where are you? Show yourself. For a long moment, Brady did little but slowly move his hands and feet, just enough to tread water as it flowed downstream, carrying him away from the monster. Brady watched the frustrated movements of Grendel and marveled at his own ability to call forth such a monster from the depths of his darkness. If he could summon Grendel, perhaps he could summon something else. He thought very hard. He imagined very hard, losing the entire world except for the thought that was preeminent in his mind. With all of his might, he called forth a titan to battle a titan. Kaylee and Joe didn't know where Brady was, and as the hours ticked past, they were both becoming more and more irritable. They knew that he had been captured, but they didn't know where he was being kept. Even now, it might be too late. It was all Kaylee could do not to imagine Brady's limp body dumped into some ravine, bereft of life and nothing more than a shell. They were driving down the road near the Bangor Mall when Joe saw the flashes of light down Mount Hope Avenue. Immediately, Kaylee steered the life seeker down the road, past Evergreen Woods and the Bangor Humane Society, down into the gully and up to the rear entrance of the cemetery near the Korean War Memorial. It was there that they saw the battle, in all of its strange, unworldly fury, flashes of light emanating from the Keras, each time one of them either gave or received a blow. Both of them sat in the life seeker, its headlights bathing the scene in white light as metal people fought in comprehensively horrific shapes. What the hell are we looking at? asked Joe. I don't have any idea, she said, her mouth hanging open. Well, whatever the hell it is, Brady can't be too far away, said Joe as he reached into the back seat with his left hand and withdrew his shotgun. 
Are you thinking what I'm thinking, asked Kaylee. Joe's face gave little trace of anything but focus and determination. If that boy is out there, we have to help him. Kaylee reached for the forty-five in her shoulder holster and withdrew it. She was already wearing the bandolier and the extra clips, her sword and various other weapons she had accumulated during her time with Brady. Joe reached into the pocket of his vest and took out a box of shells. He shot her a glance that would have melted glass and said, Be careful. He might have said, Please, don't get killed because I don't want to deal with that, and I don't want to die alone either. I have grown awfully fond of you both. He might have said that, but he didn't. Kaylee walked into the fray first, with Joe having to hobble as best as he could with his aching knees. Where she walked, he could barely even stay upright. Still, both of them studied the battle for a moment before making the determination about what side they were on. The statues, there, pointed Kaylee. That's General Chamberlain. Right, said Joe, raising the shotgun to his shoulders, taking a stance and letting go a blast of shot into the gruesome form that was nearly subduing the bronze general. Surprisingly, the blast had a definite effect. The monstrous form turned in surprise to face his new attacker, and then, as much surprised by the thing that was happening to it as he was by the reinforcements, it began to shiver and shake. The form fighting Chamberlain fell to the ground, its face contorting in confusion instead of pain. The blast hadn't killed it, but it had clearly wounded the were-dog beneath upon which this parasitic being fed. Kaylee took careful aim and let two shots from her forty-five slam into the monster. It was clear to the other Karas that they had reason for concern. The Karas inhabiting the wounded were-dogs began to vibrate and shift, appearing to melt like ice in the summer sun. They were not simply shredding themselves of the body of the wounded animal. They were also weakening. There was a screaming in the air. It was a glass scraping against glass. It was a world being rent. It was a simple cry of pain. And then the only thing left on the ground was a dead dog. When the remaining carers saw what had happened, it became clear to them that they could no longer continue in this manner. They were angry to be sure because they had nearly triumphed against the metal forms. They had no choice now. They had to flee. The screaming multiplied as the Karas each detached themselves from the were-dogs they had been secured to and took to the sky, back into the darkness from which they came, back into the netherworld where they were undoubtedly fated to go. Kaylee heard the sound of an old woman cackling into the ether. She did not know it, but it was the hag who had refused to join Grendel in the first place. She shrieked, "'Just as I thought, you fools!' He's betrayed you as he did so to me. They heard her cackling laughter fade away into nothingness. In a moment, all that remained were the weakened forms of the were-dogs, except that they were now only dogs. Katie walked over to one that had been attacking Hannibal Hamlin and pointed her pistol at it. The dog, obviously, once someone's pet and enamored of human girls, reached its muzzle up to Kaylee and licked her hand. She lowered the gun, clicking the safety back into position. "'Well met, Kaylee!' exclaimed General Chamberlain. "'My goodness,' said Hannibal Hamlin, holding his severed head under his arm. "'Why, you don't know it, young woman, but I have been watching over you as you slept in the library.' She looked at him with confusion and distrust, thinking, "'Creepy! How weird is that? A statue stalker!' Introductions were given, and Kaylee was surprised by how easy it seemed to shift realities and speak to statues as though they were alive. "'Where is Brady?' asked Joe. "'He was here, but instead of fighting Grendel, he ran. The monster followed him,' answered the logger with the peavy. "'We must find him, and quickly,' urged Chamberlain. "'He went that way,' said the logger with the axe resting on his shoulder, "'back through the cemetery.' Let's go, urged Victory, now beaming a bright flame from her remaining torch. I can't, said Joe under his breath. I, I haven't got it in me. I can drive us. There are roads to this place, said Kaylee. I will track him, said the general, and it should be easy enough. The monster knocked down gravestones as he blundered through. The shame of it, such hallowed resting ground disturbed, said the Chamberlain. It was Hannibal Hamlin who sat clearly and said, Look, General, I'm buried in this place, and let me tell you, it's been good to have a little life in a world that's known so much death. This is real. Doesn't it taste good? 
Oh, I wish I had lungs so I could light up a big old cigar and breathe it in. Oh, that would be truly living. They all looked at him with doubt, but the old statesman walked off into the darkness with an obvious smile on his face under his arm, following the trail of broken tombstones. The Careys that had detached themselves from the rare dog sought out the form of Grendel. They threw their spectral noses into the air and sniffed and found his scent down near the river, which made them wince, though they continued trekking toward it nonetheless. Sure enough, they found him near the riverside, angry and frustrated at having lost the boy again to the river. Without permission, they alighted upon him and he felt them there in the darkness. He breathed in and focused, ready for the rebonding. They were tired from their exertions, so the fusion took place more slowly than the last time, but the result was tremendous. The creature that could not see in the dark now had night vision, heat vision, cold vision, infrared and ultraviolet vision. He was exhausted from the melding process, but there was the boy floating in the water, not fifty feet from him. Through gritted teeth he said, Finally, I see you. I will follow you until you take to the shore or drown. Either way, your minutes are numbered, Renamer. Brady could see Grendel from his place in the stream. The monster now took on greater shape. He was that monster, that thing, that he'd seen while chained to the stone tower. He didn't seem diminished. In fact, he seemed somehow larger and more belligerent, perhaps grown fat on his anger and the food of battle. The monster put one foot in the water and shuddered. A long gasp emitted from what must have been a throat, and he stepped backwards like a child at the local pool, too frightened to move forward, to jump right in and let the waters surround him. I have seen the truth of things. The water was a solvent, to him. When it touched him, it dissolved the bonds that held fear to fear and anger to hate. If he stepped into the water, he would ever so slowly be diminished until there was nothing left. The river was water, and water was more than water, as Cayley had lately discovered. Water held the worlds apart and connected them all at once. End of chapter.